Alright, did everyone get a handout? Great. Cookies, snacks, all that out there as well. Um, okay. I'm going to get started just because I want to make sure that we're out of here at 7.30 and I can talk for 90 minutes straight. Um, if you'd like. And I will actually talk for quite a bit. But uh, my name is Colleen Nolan. I'm our school psychologist, our behavior specialist. I used to work in Washington County and I consult to classrooms. I'm now working in Tillamook, Clatsop, and Columbia, Columbia County. Thank you. Um, so I travel around. I consult to um, our classrooms, such as ones that you might find here. Um, I consult to community preschools, such as Head Starts and preschool promise classrooms. I consult to our teachers and to parents to help them understand children's challenging behavior. So I've put together a little presentation for you all um, to kind of give you some ideas of ways to um, first to understand behavior because that's kind of the, the most important piece and then some strategies and supports and how to respond and help support your child to either prevent behaviors or when behaviors are happening some better ways to respond. Um, when that's happening. Uh, I'm going to talk for the full 90 minutes or Stacy's going to help me out. So take breaks as you need. Check on your kids as you need. The bathroom's right around the corner. Get snacks and things like that. Okay? All right. Just going to get started. Um, yeah. So I assume you're all here because you have kids with some challenging behaviors, some things you want to work on, some things you're unsure about. Um, I will say I asked that because a couple years ago I did this and one parent was like, oh, I thought this was mandatory. Um, it's not mandatory, so if you think that, you're welcome to go. Um, but I do have a lot of information for you. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. Very specific scenarios and incidences are going to be really hard for me to answer because I'm going to want to know a lot more information about the behavior, but I'm happy to either chat with you or would redirect you back to your, your classroom teacher, your service coordinator, whoever you work with. Um, the most and they can either contact me or one of our other uh, support specialists to help you as well. Um, and if I'm going too fast, you can slow me down, all that. So first of all, challenging behavior. It generally occurs as a way of communication. When I see a child with a behavior, whether it's hitting, running away, spitting, throwing chairs, um, these are probably all things I just saw this morning. To me, when I see that, not kidding, eating beads. Um, when I see a behavior, my first thought is, this child's trying to communicate something to me and they don't have the words or skills to do it. So my flag goes up for, I need to help. My flag does not go up, I need, sometimes I need to stop it because it's dangerous. Um, but that's usually what I'm thinking of when I see it. What is happening and why is this child communicating this behavior? What's the scenario and what can I do to help them? So that's generally the first way that I look at behavior. The other way I look at it is that the child does not have the communication or the social skills in that moment to do better. If they did, they would. Children want to do well, right? And they might do well one day or one situation, and they might struggle two hours later with the same situation. In that moment, they did not have the skills to kind of access the skills in their brain to do better than what we would have expected or what we would have liked. Um, most kids here, all of your kids here are identified with kids with special needs, which means they're lagging some skill. Um, we can't expect what we would expect for a three, four, or five-year-old, depending on what their areas of delay are. Um, and most of our kids struggle with communication. Even my kids with the strongest communication skills who speak in sentences, if they struggle with emotional development and social development, they can't use those communication skills in, um, in place of that behavior in that moment. They might be able to tell me about it later. They might be able to maybe tell me about it later. Not always, but there's usually a skill that they're missing and we want to make sure that we are trying to identify what the skill is that they're missing so we can teach that to them. Um, it is really hard to change behavior. Um, I'm doing a lot of work just personally learning about the brain and how the brain works, and we're going to talk about it just a smidge. Uh, but I do encourage you to read a lot of Dr. Siegel's work, uh, The Whole Brain Child. And by read his work, I don't, I've don't. i yet to read one of his books. The best thing about him is you can just Google search him, and he has little sh snippets, and people have shortcuts, and little just 
things that he says and does, and we're going to watch a video on it, um, but he's really helpful in understanding how your child's brain works to help you understand why we might be seeing those behaviors. Um, just like any other habit, it's not going to change overnight. Um, we have to make sure that what we're doing is consistent and practicing and things like that to reach a goal to hopefully extinguish the behavior or replace it with a better skill. And I'm always going to say a better skill may not be the perfect skill, um, but I'm happy for a kid who goes from hitting and throwing things. Uh, I'm okay with them just yelling at me instead, <laughs> right? We've gotten to something better and a little bit safer. Um, and I'm going to accept that yelling and then hopefully then work towards the next better skill that I'm looking for. Um, one of the things we have to do and what I work a lot with, um, not necessarily our teachers, our teachers are great in having this mindset. Um, sometimes it's in the community that's a little harder. Um, and parents, it's not necessarily the way that we were raised or, um, or seen others raised, but changing our mindset. I don't talk about bad behaviors. I don't talk about bad kids. I don't talk about anything like that. What I talk about is, I call them challenging behaviors, but it's not that the kid is bad. It's just that they, miss, they don't have the skills that we need. Their behaviors aren't the ones that I prefer, but I, don't tr I try not to think of it as a bad kid. And you will never, hopefully, ever hear anyone in this building say that your child is bad. Um, when people try and tell me that the child does it deliberately, I will fight you on that. Um, I don't think anybody does it deliberately. A child will do well if they could. Um, if it's deliberate, then I still want to know what skill are they missing um, that doesn't, that allows another kid to not do it deliberately, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, that's one of the first things is kind of let's focus on the actual behavior, not the, the child. Um, and then thinking about every behavioral interaction is a learning opportunity. We do not do punishment consequences, things like that. Here, when I am confronted with a behavior, I take that as an opportunity to learn more about the child, to help teach the child if I can, or just to work with calming the child down. Um, never looking to punish and think about what the consequence is. It's always an opportunity for me to work with the child to get through whatever is challenging for them. Um, so one of the things changing within ourselves is we really want to focus on teaching the skills or a skill that your child is missing that would really help them hopefully do better in that situation. Um, we want to talk about rela uh, replacement behaviors and then again examining and changing our response um, to behavior. This isn't always anyone's favorite part. Uh, but I cannot change a child's behavior. What I can change is how I respond to then help hopefully influence and support the child so that the behavior doesn't either continue or occur again. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. I, got, I saw it a long time, um, and I really tried to live by it, and it will do you wonders in all of your life, not just with your kids, but with your spouses, your partners, your bosses. Um, if there's anything that we wish to change in the child, we should first examine it and see whether it is not something that could better be changed in ourselves. So I'm constantly thinking and looking, what am I doing that might be making this behavior worse? Not that I'm the cause of it, right? I don't, I don't put that much blame or weight on me. But what can I be doing differently so I can either prevent the behavior or that when I respond to behavior, it hopefully doesn't get worse. Does that make sense? And if what I'm doing is making that behavior worse or escalate, I need to think about me changing myself. I cannot physically force a child to, it's not true, I could physically force a child to stop doing something. That's not how we operate here. We want to work on teaching and supporting and doing things like that. Um, so one of the things we think about, this is in almost every training I do, and I do multiple trainings a year, whether it's for parents or for our teachers or for communities. Um, but thinking about re behavior and trying to reframe it. So if a child doesn't know the alphabet, we teach them. If they don't know their colors or how to tie their shoes, we teach them, or we can teach them. If they don't know how to brush their teeth, we can teach them. But if you get to the bottom and if we say, if the child doesn't know how to behave, rarely do I get somebody who says, oh, well, we can teach them how to behave. I, I usually get what's the punishment or what's the consequence going to be. Um, and again, I don't think much in consequence. I'll tell you what the consequence is, the natural one. Your child's not going to have very many friends, right? Or there's the consequence of your child's going to miss out on things that they really, really like because they're 
you know, having a tantrum. So those to me are just the natural consequences and unfortunate ones for our little guys or little girl. Um, so what I like to do is think about behavior. If a child doesn't know how to behave, we can teach them. If they don't know how to share, transition, handle big emotions, um, share, take turns, all those other things, these are all things that we can teach them. They're not things we usually think to teach, um, and we don't need to teach them to all kids. Some kids pick it up naturally in their environment and just the interactions, and some kids need very specific teaching around these things. Um, so um, we want to make sure that that's what we're thinking. What do I need to teach my child to help them to help prevent these behaviors or help them handle the situation a little bit better than what was from the last time. This is also my mantra. If I don't stay calm, then we're going nowhere. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Most of the kids that I'm interacting with are not calm, right? And so if that child's not calm and I'm not calm, We've got nowhere to go but to probably clash or cry together or me start throwing things, right? And that's, that's not getting us anywhere. I joke. I don't throw things. Um, but I try not to match the child, right? I'm trying to get the child to match me. Um, I found this quote. I keep kind of adding quotes as I see them. Um, when little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our calm and not join their chaos. Right? And if you do, that's fine. We've done it. Well, hopefully we'll give you some other strategies and things today to not help you join their chaos or to support them a little bit better um, in those situations. Uh, this is a video we're going to watch. This is Dr. Dan Siegel. I'm going to pass out a handout. It's called The Hand Model of the Brain or The Brain in the Palm of Your Hand. This might seem a little advanced for some of our kids when he talks about doing this with or for our kids. Um, but I'll explain a little bit how it relates, uh, yeah, take one and pass it down, how it can relate to um, what we're talking about today. I have a feeling we have a technical difficulty. Sorry, I had it pulled up and it looks like I closed it. This is all our secret information. Just so you know. That's probably hopefully very meaningless to you guys. All right. We might need one more. Oh, right here. Hold on. I'm going to pause it so I make sure. <coughs> One of the most rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens with the brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up represents the wrist, and then you have from the skull, the brain stem, and the limbic area which work together to regulate the arousal and your emotions, the way you have a fight, fight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brainstem areas, and the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so the person's oriented like this, is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem areas. This regulation is very important because sometimes we can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button, and we can flip our lids. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning, and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. Now, you can actually bring yourself back online and come back to the high road and make a repair with your child, and that's important to explain to them. And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, 
how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brain stem and limbic areas here, and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to flip their lids. So I've had kids come tell me that they're about to go flip their lids and they need a break. They need a time out. And by even just naming that, they can tame it. And that's the power of using a hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day to day life. All right. So a little complex for some of our little kids. Um, but what I like and how I like to use this um, is for ourselves, to think about for ourselves, or if you have a partner here that you can communicate with and just start to think if your child's starting to lose it, start imagining if their lid is flipped. They don't have the skills that they need. So whether it's their communication skills, their problem solving skills, those higher level thinking skills, they don't have access to them right now. They're running on the emotional side of their brain so any lecturing, any teaching, any over information, too much information we are giving at that moment, in one ear, out the other, they're missing it. And so it's important for us to recognize when our child has flipped their lid. It's important for us to recognize when we've flipped our lid. Um, I use it to communicate in, with, in my classrooms with teachers just to kind of let them know, like, hey, this little one's kind of kind of here, right? Because if a child's about to flip their lid, I want to intervene. Or if their lid is flipped, it kind of gives them a signal like, okay, we've lost kind of all control, and now it's up to us to help them regain that control, right? So you can use it at home just to think about. You can teach your child about flipping their lid, whether you do it simply um, and talk to them about what that might feel like and happens, but I use it more for the adults to, to kind of get a picture of, okay, their lid is flipped. What do I do now? And the first thing I'll tell you to do is to stop talking to them because they do not have the skills or the ability to access that part of their brain um, at all, most likely in that moment. Um, same way as if, you, if your lid is flipped. You're overwhelmed, you're frustrated, and you're just like, stop talking to me, I can't take it. Right? If our kids could say that, I think they would. I hope they would. <coughs> Leave me alone. Their behavior to me is communicating that. I'm overwhelmed too much. My lid is flipped. I can't handle whatever is happening right now. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about how do we prevent, <coughs> approach, and respond to challenging behaviors. I think I have a little bit more review about, um, a little bit about the meaning of behaviors and then some of the things that we can do to support them. Um, so a couple things to think about. Kind of the basic look at, at behavior is trying to figure out what the function is. This is probably one of the more basic ones. We're moving a little bit away from this, but generally, a child's behavior is trying to gain something or escape something, whether it's to gain your attention, whether it's to gain control of the situation or of a toy or a game, um, whether it's to gain food, sensory input, something like that. They are seeking something and their behavior seems to be trying to gain something. The other general function of behavior is often to escape something. They want to escape a task. They want to escape a routine that you guys have at home, trying to escape sensory input um, or, or a demand that you've put on them. Um, if we can determine the function of the behavior, we can work towards teaching them more appropriate skills. I can teach a child how to appropriately gain my attention. You actually don't have to hit me or spit at me to get my attention. It's like you could just tap me on the shoulder or you could do, there's other ways. Um, I can teach a child how to escape a task appropriately. Yes. So how do you actually teach a child to come to tap you? We practice. We practice when they're not upset. And what would that actually look like, I guess? Sure. Um, so to come and get you or to get my attention, um, if we're just playing, and I might say, hey, it depends on how much language. I don't know how much language your children understand it, so that will vary. But we might just be playing, and um, I might practice it with them. Hey, remember when you yelled for me the other day? You can actually just tap my shoulder and then have them practice it. And I pretend to, I'm going to pretend to ignore you. This is pretty higher level. Yeah. I'm going to ignore you. The other thing that I do is, um, and so we might practice it in play. Mm -hmm. I've had lunch with a little girl who we practiced. I would say no to her because when somebody told her no, she'd lose it. We had lunch together, and I said, I noticed you really don't like when people tell you no. 
let's practice that and practice some responses. So she would tell me no, I'd pre pretend to, to freak out, or I'd pretend to give her the right skill, and practicing it in those moments. Um, other times in the moment for some kids, um, if they throw something at me and I assume that they want my attention, I might just take their hand and just say, hey, oh, is that what you needed for someone who doesn't have the language and cannot handle all that language that I just used? So in the moment, somebody hits me, I just go, oh, you could just tap me, right? And we might practice, or I'd show them. And sometimes I'd just take their hand and show them how to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the moment, I'm not telling them, no, that's not how you do it. Right. I'm not even, I'm in my head going, okay, what do they do? They want my attention. Okay, let me try it appropriately. Um, same for kids that kind of just throw things when they're done. I got a lot of those kids that are just done. I will go pick up the item and give it back to them, and I just say, if you're done, just put it down here. And then I praise them. Yeah. Right? And you did it. Right? And so either, if I, either I have to create the opportunities, or when the behavior happens and their lid isn't totally flipped, they're just, that's the best skill that they have, then I'm going to prompt them to practice it. And then I'm going to celebrate them. Right? Um, and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. Do you want to try it again? Because some kids might do it again, right? And you could do this for 10 minutes, right? And praise and praise and then try to remind them next time type of thing. But the idea is you're creating new pathways for new skills. She's got a pathway or he's got a pathway that this is just how I do it. This is my best skill. So what he kind of will actually do is he he will just say quietly or point at things. Okay. And then if you don't see him or you don't notice, Okay. And so it's... So sometimes you have to kind of catch it. Do you respond when he quietly points? Oh, absolutely. So what we have to do is not respond to when he's quietly pointing, but respond by giving him the next skill that you want. Does that make sense? Sure. Because when you don't... But he'll just not... Okay, I don't need that toy anymore. Like he, if you make him... If, if I don't go and say, like, oh, you want that toy? How do you ask? He'll just find a new toy. Like, yeah. it's, it's one of those where, yeah... It's... Actually, and I might give him the words exactly that you want him to say. Because by saying, how do you ask? He's like, I don't know. We, we have all those scripts. The scripts. Great. Words. Yeah. Working on it. But, yeah. We're good there. Um, but yeah, making sure we give him the words. And I, I'm not one that says, use your words, or how do we do that? I just tell them what to say. And I still do it with my 10-year-old nephew. <laughs> you can just say, Colleen, I don't like that. I, I just go right to what I want him to say. I will just give him the script right, right away. My nephew does not have special needs. He's got perfectly normal communication, except when he's having an emotional kind of meltdown, right? And I'll just say, Finn, you could just say, Colleen, please stop, or I coach him to do it to his brother is usually what the problem is. It's not usually me. I just go and I give them the skill that I want. And just for the record, so hi, I'm your other presenter. I'm Stacey. I'm one of the program coordinators. I also am a school psychologist, and I used to do this presentation with Colleen. So um, you'll still need to do that for your kids when they're like 19 and 20. And my youngest is 19, and I'll say, well, honey, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to be a jerk about it. Just say, Mom, I don't want to do that right now. Like, I'm an adult. I can manage my own feelings. So it's a good habit to get into. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about with Colleen talking about prompting for or teaching the new skill, there's a... There's a meme circulating on Facebook right now, and I don't know if it's true, but it sounds really good, so I'll share it. And that is that when somebody is learning a new skill, it can take like the four or five hundred repetitions um, unless it's done in play, and then it's like 10 to 20 repetitions. So if you want to teach your child to get your attention, in, like by tapping or saying, hey, mom, the best way to do that would be to sit down and play with them and embed it in that play. So as you're going back and forth, you might model that, oh, hey, Tom, look at this. Um, when you want my attention, you can say, hey, mom, or if he shows you something, oh, say, hey, mom. So anyway, just that would be a natural way to start building that skill and that habit to build that new neural pathway for the child. <coughs> Yes. Sorry, last one. What oh. if they start saying, just say, Mom, go, because that's what ours says. Uh, then I eliminate the just say. Okay. It, and it's going to get hard. It's, there are yeah, kids that repeat, cool. and um, I use a partner in our classroom. Sometimes I'm the voice of the kid, and I ask a teacher to give the demands. Does that make sense? So, if it's okay. so you might have to work yeah. together. I know you're not always going to be there together, but there are those kids. When I'm trying to like 
hey, you could say, stop, I don't like it, and the kid would just hit him and like, stop, I don't like it. I'm like, no, not you, you, right? Like, it gets really complicated. And so for some kids, I have to te- work with our teachers and say, I'm going to give, I'm going to be his voice, you give him the command. And then so the teacher gives him the command, and then I can say, no, thanks, teacher. And then, I, right, so the teacher doesn't have to say, you can say, no, thanks, teacher, and it doesn't get as complicated. Right. That, it, it does get a little complicated for some kids who can't kind of decipher some of that, or if you're working with a couple of kids at the same time, it's like, no, not you, you, but it's hard to, but working together. So yeah. one's the voice, and one, yeah, so you're kind of, I'm almost next to them or behind them and just being like whispering. whispering. Um, I've done it in our classroom where I see a kid get off task and getting mad at the teacher, and I just say, Preston, you could just say, teacher, can I have a turn? And he goes, teacher, can I have a turn? And then if she says no, I coach him through the rest of it too, right? Just oh, I'm really still cool. there coaching him, and I'm yeah. still his voice because um, I can't predict always what the teacher is going to say, but I can help him respond to right. something like that. Yes? On the other end of this behavior is function. What do you Like my little one likes to escape the stuff. Like yeah. something as mundane as I have to change your diaper right now or I want to escape the shopping cart or just escape from, you know, the money. Any task. Any demand. Task, yeah. I'm saying, okay, we have to do something right now, and she doesn't want to do it, so escape, how do you help them? So we're going to get there. So I haven't even gotten to some of the strategies. No, it's totally fine. I want, that's good, though, because I want to keep that in mind, so I make sure that I help you answer that. Um, and there are kids that will say no to everything, right? Because they just think you put on a demand. I say no because I don't actually quite know what you're even asking or what I even want at this moment because I'm a four-year-old with a two-year-old brain right now, and I can't. Now, now, like, I have a lot of four- or five-year-olds stuck in that yeah. two-year-old toddler yeah. no stage, right? And it's hard because they're, like, this big, and you're like, you should know better, but they don't know better, and that's where I have to start to change my mindset and thinking about that a little bit. Like, in my head, I could say, I wish you knew better, but I, coming out, I have to give something different because oh, that's not helpful. You know better. No, I don't. If I did, I would try it. Um, So some of the things to think about and just thinking about how do we determine the function of the behavior, I I don't always expect you to do this, but I do encourage at times to just sit back and watch. (coughs) See how a behavior plays out, if it's safe, right? I'm not telling you to just let, but I let kids sometimes leave our classroom because I want to know where they really want to go to see if they really have a place to go. Now, I also want to know if they just get out there and are like, oh, what just happened, right? That's all good information for me. So I don't always stop unless it's an unsafe thing, right? I will follow. I will not let them out of our doors, I promise you. But I might see just kind of where they go and what they're drawn to or why they might be escaping. So trying to let something play out can be helpful. And sometimes they're not really doing anything naughty. They just don't have the best way of doing it. I was observing a little guy, and I noticed about four times whenever he had a task, he always looked like he was off task because he couldn't go from A to B. He would go from A to the door to this to this. But he always got to where he was going. But if I were a teacher, I would assume right away that he's off task and he's not going to get to where he's going. And he made it to it every time. And I said, if you just kind of watch, it doesn't mean it's not annoying or it doesn't, but at least I know where he's going. So we don't have to correct them every time. But sometimes if you can just let things play out. Um, talk about it with others, your family, your partner, um, your teachers, or your, whoever comes and helps support your child. And just, like, what do you think is happening? Why do you think? And we can all have different opinions. It's totally fine because we're going to see situations differently. But if we can start to figure out what it is they want or need, I can start to figure out how to help them appropriately escape a task or appropriately most likely make a choice or motivate them and make that task a little bit more appealing for now. Um. All right, so my first response to any behavior is usually a whoa, 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 like what's happening, what's going on? That's usually how I, if, if I'm not there, somebody throws something at me, somebody, whoa, like I want to know, I'm trying to communicate to them that I'm here and I'm on your side and I'm ready to listen not you're in trouble, I'm going to scream at you, and you better run. Because if they run, now i got to chase them, right? Now i got a whole other behavior I'm working on. I don't want them to be scared or to think that I'm not, you know, there to help. So my general response, I'm approaching, there's a fight going on over, I come in, whoa, 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 hold on. 
or somebody throws something, I say, oh, whoa, let me help you, right? Not, that's not okay. They already know it's not okay 99% of the time, so we don't have to tell them. Um, not, you need to stop, because you need turns into, oh, watch me, <laughs> or how's that gonna, how are you gonna make that happen? Um, so I avoid a lot of those things, and I, and I put up whoa, 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 because one of my teachers said, you know, I tried that at my band practice one day, and everyone just calmed, because I didn't know what else to say or to do. But I remember you saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. After, after Colleen told me about that, I coached my husband, and that's what he says now. When I start to get worked up, he'll be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> Do we need to use that tone of voice? Yeah, like, whoa, what's going on? And it does, and yeah, people use it back at me. I'm like, ah, self-check, thank you. Right? And I appreciate those self-checks. But um, I might do a whoa, and I might go, what's happening? Or, wow, your face looks really mad right now. It helped the kid this morning who was throwing chairs, and I had a picture of mad. Luckily, because I was in a preschool and had great pictures, and I said, well, are you mad right now? And he looks and he goes, yeah. And I was like, oh. right, I just brought him down a notch. And then I can work with him because he had stopped throwing chairs. He's like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, we can work on this then, right? And that was just enough for me then to get there to connect with him to then support him through it. That didn't solve the problem, but it was the first step of just helping identify a feeling or going, whoa, this must be really hard for you. Because the child, first, they don't expect that response from us. Most likely with the behavior they're expecting, I think he was expecting me to probably yell at him as he's yelling at me. Ah, da, da. No words, just yelling. Oh, you sound really mad. And he's like, oh, yeah. And then we were able to work it through. Sometimes I can say, I see, this is really hard. Hold on, hold on, let me help you, right? My, the idea is that I'm communicating to them that I'm here right now to help you with whatever major problem you are dealing with. Major problem to them, right? Not to me. But getting in a shopping cart can be a major problem. Even though once they get in the shopping cart, they absolutely love the shopping cart. Or yesterday they loved the shopping cart, and today they don't like the shopping cart, right? Um, things happen or our emotions overtake us. Those lids flip, and then they don't have the skills to, to deal with it in that moment. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about if it's to gain control. Um, some of these, to me, kind of overlap. Sometimes I think it's to gain control, or it seems it's to gain control, and sometimes it seems it's to escape the demand. That one kind of sounds, feels like an escape of the demand, but it could be an a need for control because you're saying you need to do this. Whoop. Well, I don't need to do anything. I am a child and I can throw a fit and I can refuse and things like that. So for that one I might do, I might think about it more as a control thing and giving choices. Do you want me to bounce you into the shopping cart? Or do you want to, does she have any other options other than getting in the shopping cart? Or he? Great, 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 great. That's, <laughs> I can work with that one too. So, you can get in the shopping cart, or you can walk next to me and hold on. Well, what do you feel like I gave her, say, okay, you can get in the shopping cart, but usually it ends up within 10 seconds. She's buckled in, but she gets out and is trying to climb off the cart or grab something in the cart, and, you know. So, so it's like, what part of me is thinking of what do you need? What are you reaching for? Is there something yeah. on the shelf, or do you want to help? Um, depending on kind of the age and the skills, it might just mean that she needs something else to distract her, right? And, yeah. and how old is your child? She's three, and three yeah. like not speech delays. So. Speech delays and three. So still young at three, and then also whatever delays or difficulties that she has. Yeah, go, did you want to add to this? Well, no, I just I wanted to ask, what's the alternative do you have to get in your car seat? Uh, it's car how you get in your car seat, who right. buckles in. Uh, do you want to sing a song while we get in your car? I can make up a million choices, of, but the end result is we're ending <laughs> up in the car seat. Does it make, like, do you want me to bounce you into your car seat? Um, sometimes, and it's hard because some kids hate that sleeping car seat. Like, yeah. I know that. Um, sometimes if I know it's already hard, I don't have anything to really cool to show you. I'm not going to pull out my phone to do it, but I might say, I might be prepared. Well, I have your teddy bear for when you get in your car seat. So what I've tried is the book where you have the pin and you can color it and it changes color. Yeah. Um, I, I, 
I've tried all of that stuff, and really now the only thing that works is we have a DVD player in the car, and I'll say, if you can sit in your car seat, then you can watch a little bit of Paw Patrol. Okay. But, I, but I worry about that technique, because then it's going to be, oh, well, I'm going to always watch Paw Patrol, or I'm not going to get my car seat. Sure. So, so we have to start to shape it. It's not a terrible tactic. It's a... So let me talk about choices first, and then I'll talk about what you just did, which is um, setting up an expectation and giving a reward. Other people might call it bribing. The shopping cart, too. It's like the only way to get her to stay in the shopping cart is like if you're playing apps on my phone so that she'll actually sit still and stay in the shopping cart. Like, is there, what would be like, how much transition are off of like that's the only way to get you to cooperate for this, you know, 10 minute long? Grocery. It's going to take some time. But, so some of it is to think about why does she hate this grocery trip? Right? Is it really that awful for her? And do I need to make this the most comfortable thing because I have to buy groceries? So you have to start to weigh some of these. You have to get your child yeah. in the car seat, right? And I've tried waiting it out, I mean, but we can't always. Like, yeah. if there's a doctor's appointment, yeah. I mean, we've sat in parking lots for 40 minutes, but because I'll tell her, we can't go until you get in there. So I'm gonna, I will touch on this. Since you're both kind of talking about the devices, which is a very common thing, which is a very motivating thing. But I don't like doing that. Sure. But I'm, that's why I'm going to touch on it a little bit. It's, it's not always my favorite. I use it. I will be on, as a professional behavior specialist. I want to use what is going to work and be effective because I want to practice the expected behavior. And if that's the only way that I can practice the expected behavior, then that because if I never practice doing the appropriate skill, I'm never going to get that pathway. Now, I'm going to use that. I'm going to set it up ahead of time. It's not a bribe. It's not throw a fit, then I'm going to offer you the device. If I know the device is what's going to work for me for right now, I'm going to say, I have your Paw Patrol movie for when you get in your car seat. Does that make sense? So before. Yeah. and Well, it's only a pro it's very periodic. Okay. So that's why it's hard for me because it, it's some days she has absolutely no problem, several days in a row. All day long she'll have no problem with it, and then I'll go to put her in and... I wonder if there's something like that that's periodic is thinking about like just like a little sticker chart for every time she does do it because here's the other thing once they get in their car seat I am going to praise them specifically you are in your car seat this is amazing and I'm going to do something fun and tickle and like oh I can't believe you did it like exaggerate right and praise and it might be something of like oh my gosh you did it oh my gosh you did it especially because yours is a little bit more unpredictable so I'm going to start concretely rewarding that with just a sticker, mm -hmm. right? And if you get this many stickers, then, you know, whatever you want with that. It doesn't even have to lead to something. Sometimes kids just are okay with the sticker and like seeing their success and seeing their success type of thing. Um, part of me would try to dig a little bit deeper about what those moments are, but it could be tired, I'm hungry, I can't deal with this right now, Mom, right? Like physiological and and if you can anticipate that I would try to like oh man she's been crabby today I think this car seat might be hard I'm gonna throw that I'm gonna put that device ahead of the behavior even if she's not crabby I really like how you did blah 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 today when you get in your car seat right because you're, you're starting to be preventative and pre trying to predict when it's gonna happen does that make sense? A little complicated, but um, but also just starting to praise specifically and concretely those behaviors because she is doing it, right. and just wonder what those challenging days are. Now I'm going to come to you in just a minute. Sorry, I could be doing this all day, and I will be doing this all night. Um, back to yours a little bit. Same type of thing is there could be more going on with that grocery store. Grocery stores stink. I love grocery stores. I hate sections of the grocery store. And I walk around like this. Okay? If I were a kid, I'd probably be crying and screaming and saying, I'm not going in there. Right? And so if it maybe just is something that's truly hard, use the device. Say, I recognize that shopping is really hard for you. I want you to have fun and enjoy this with me. And praise her. Or maybe say, I'm going to set a timer and after two minutes of us do, eh, 30 seconds, let's start easy, 30 seconds or something on your phone, you sit in this for 30 seconds and we go down, or we go down one aisle, here's the iPad, or here's my phone, right, and then you start building on it, because the idea would be to build 
per tolerance. Yes. Oh, I can now do 45 seconds, right? Yeah. So then it's fewer yeah. and fewer times. You're still celebrating and praising her for being in that cart. You're thinking of other things and then working towards fading it out as well. Okay. There are some kids that just need something, right? Be yeah. Because that's a very difficult task for them to do, and there's no way to avoid it because you guys have to go grocery shopping, and there's no. So part of it, me says... Be predictable and make it easier and put it out in front of the behavior so that it is not a bribe. It is an expectation that I am setting. And when you meet, <coughs> meet the expectation, please don't say this to the kid when you meet my expectation. But, hey, you sit in your seat. I have my phone. We've just eliminated her practicing that tantrum, that practicing that running away. Because that's what I want to eliminate. And I don't want to practice the negative behavior. I want to practice the positive ones. And I'm not opposed to using a favorite item or a reward system to build the skill. Meanwhile, celebrating, praising, reminder, oh my gosh, you're still in this. I love that you're in the shopping cart. This is so helpful type of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go hurt and then... Mine was actually just a comment. My boys sure. are extremely food driven. So when we've gone grocery shopping or target run, whatever it is, I have, especially my four year old who has these behavioral issues, is I say, okay, I have to pick up however many things it is. If I can pick up, you know, two or three of these and you're being an awesome listener, whatever my goal is, then I say, we're going to go down the kids' snack aisle and you can pick out a snack which is fantastic because then he's eating the whole time he's really happy the rest of the time shopping trip. That's right. That's probably last about 10 seconds with her, her food and then over it. And <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have a feeling that has worked for me. The little one doesn't quite know what he or she like wants. It's sensory overload for her in there, basically. Yeah, so, so then... too much to process and I want everything in the entire store. And then I don't want it. I just picked it out, yeah. right? I just watched. Yeah, it's overwhelming. And so that's part of why I'm not opposed to using something to help her stay focused. I would love to move away from a phone and a device, um, thinking about headphones or sunglasses or a hat, something that helps dim that sensory. But until you figure out what those things are, I don't want her practicing a meltdown. I do not want her practicing running away. I want them to just practice the skill that I want so I can praise it. And so I can calmly problem solve in the back of my head what else I can do yeah. versus panicking or fretting or being frustrated myself. Because then you lose your skills, right? And, like, it, it doesn't, you're not going to be able to yeah. help solve the problem eventually. Oh, sorry, pink, and uh, then you. Yeah. yeah. What about the idea that if you use, like, a preemptive, not a bribe, mm -hmm. distraction, then that builds an expectation? Because I was using that as like a kind of grocery store coping mechanism. Like, yeah. Okay, first thing I would do is like, go buy a little bag of snacks and just say, okay, like here's your snack, we're going to go shopping now. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, people said, oh, but now every time you go shopping, like your kid expects to get a snack. It's possible, but it's also, so I talk about starting to fade that. So now it's not every time we go shopping, but now that I, you can do this, so now I'm going to go up two aisles, and then we're going to get a snack. Okay. And now I'm going to pay, and then you're going to get it. So you're starting to bump that snack off to a point where actually they, and also in the meantime, celebrating that skill, recognizing that skill, and you're doing it and trying to figure out what else is kind of going on. That, it, I mean, we're not still giving our kids M&Ms for going to the bathroom, right? Are your kids still getting <laughs> no, I mean, M&Ms? That's what I was going to say. We're going to pee. Who cares if you buy them a snack? Eventually it fades. Yeah. You know, they get older and you don't have... I mean, I used to give my son gummy bears yeah. and something else. And, you know, I don't still have to give him gummy bears when it's time to go to the grocery store. Okay. So. And for some kids, it doesn't fade as quickly, right? We're talking about kids with developmental delays. And so some kids, they don't fade. Some things we can move towards something different. Um, some kids are always going to need something to carry. We're just going to start to think about what's a little bit more appropriate and affordable or reasonable or things like that. But you can start to fade it because you're going to start to up your expectation a little bit. Okay. Like, yeah, you went to the store, we got your snack. I wonder if today, after I put four things in my cart, then we get a snack. Do you think you could do four things? Can we count to four together? All right, here's one. And they're going to be four quick things the first time. Does that make sense? So now you're starting to fade it. And then eventually it might be 
Oh my gosh, we just went to the grocery store and you didn't even need a snack? Like, that is amazing. Um, sensory issues are hard. And unless you address the sensory issues, you're not going to have, be able to necessarily remove some of those kind of treats or rewards or expectations and things like that. So it's also at the same time trying to figure out the needs, but you can't figure it out if you all are stressed and like, right, if you can't go to the grocery store and if grocery store panics you and we don't need all that, right? We want to make sure that you're getting, there are more important things to work on with your child and your child's skills um, in the moment. We'll get to all of those eventually. We've got a long time. Not that it helps with the behavior at all. But Walmart, you can do online grocery ordering and drive, park, it's right your car. <laughs> yeah, Fred Meyer, click it. Yeah. And part of it is not, it, it might think like, hey, we're just avoiding the problem, but some problems are okay to avoid in the moment because you're working on so many other things or you don't have that tool yet. If it's an auditory thing, I've seen kids going grocery shopping with the headphones. Or headphones, uh, wearing sunglasses or a silly outfit, sometimes even dress up clothes, somehow disguises you or feels <coughs> like you're doing something different. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm a fan of just a puffy coat and a vest and I'm shocked that I'm not wearing one right now because that's a really comforting <coughs> item to me, right? Hats are really, mostly because they're not appropriate for what I'm presenting, but I have all my little things that I like to do too and starting to think about that. Um, I don't say avoid the problem forever. Sometimes we can put things to the side yeah. so that we can live and function and enjoy our, enjoy our children, right? Because that's important too. Um, so things about control, if we think it's about control, um, there's a few strategies, kind of depends on your child, giving them choices. Um, do you want to run down the hall or do you want to hop like a bunny down the hall to your bedroom? Uh, do you want me to bounce you into the bathtub or do you want to slither in like a snake? So those are kind of some of the more fun ones. The holding hand one is kind of a tough one. Um, but I might do a, do you want to hold my hand, or do you want to hold, or do you want me to hold your hand? A lot of our kids don't like that holding their hand. We've taken away a lot of control by putting our hand, but sometimes you can put your hand out in a way that they feel comfortable holding your hand. It takes a lot of trust, for especially for our impulsive runners, um, but um, I might let them just hold one of my finger. Hey, just hold my finger, right? At least I know or can get a sense that if they're about to let go, that I'm also ready to be there. Um, if they don't want to hold my hand, then maybe they'll let me hold their coat, right? Or their hood, not their hood, sorry. That sounds like a choking hazard. But like the back of their coat, <laughs> below their hood. Um, just thinking about ways to give them choices to make them feel empowered. Um, it takes some quick thinking in the moment, but think about some of the things your kids hate and then start thinking about some of the choices that you can give them that are acceptable, but still get the thing met. Um, a lot of times if it's about the number of things, or if you're gonna, if you know I give them four gummies and they're always gonna want more, I'm gonna anticipate, oh, do you want three or do you want four? Or do you want two minutes or do you want four minutes on my device? I'm always gonna give choices about how much time within reason. And then they go, no, seven, and seven wasn't really a choice. And I go, oh, seven would be cool, but it's, I can't, you know, it's not an option right now. I just want to have some time with the running away. Yeah. How do you offer a choice from somewhere where you can run in a parking lot, like where it's to get across the parking lot? Mm -hmm. I'll try and offer that choice if you can hold my hand or I can hold your wrist. Yeah. But she's not going to choose either 90% of the time when she's carrying a silly child across the parking lot. How, how do I Does she want to be carried? No, she doesn't want to I think I, I'm like, I love your little kid right now because I feel like she has no idea what she wants except to be free, right? And so you put any boundaries or limits and she's, ah, right? So I'm going to start thinking about how do I give her as much freedom without giving her total freedom. Um, part of it is, and it takes time, but if I know that when I open the door that my child's going to run, I'm not opening that door until I get some sort of plan yeah. with my child. So that makes sense. And, um, and you can, I mean, hey, we're going to the store. Let's think about how we do this, right? They're still buckled in. Yeah. Or, right, they're not crawling all over. I'm going to get their attention first and making a plan of how we're getting into the store. Um, 
thinking about stuff like that and instead of waiting. Sometimes we wait and hope that we're going to make it to the store or the parking lot or through, and then it happens, and that's where we've flipped our lid and we've lost kind of all skills, and that's where we have to scoop them up and go. Um, so thinking ahead, parking lots are hard. What kind of things can I do in a parking lot that will help my child? Maybe you and her are going to run together. Oh, that's yeah. Does that, I mean, if it, it sounds like a little one that like has this need to go, and so it's like, hey, are we going to run together, or are we going to tiptoe like a, as slow as a sloth or something like that? And you know she's going to pick a run, so wear your running shoes. I wear running shoes every day to work. Um, this is my new outfit. I own so many pairs of running shoes right now, so I just, I know it, right? So if she likes to run, you run together. Because then what can you do? We did it together. You held my hand. That was amazing. You can start to celebrate it, and then we can start to build something else. But if you just have a kid that goes, sometimes we have to keep up with them for a moment until we can start building and then practicing other skills versus correcting frustration, all those other things. Does that make sense? Um, and honestly, if a kid's going to run, for the tell me they're going to run, so I'm ready to run too, <laughs> right? Uh, and so making a plan, yeah. is that how we're going to do it? Okay, well, what about if a car comes? What do we do? We stop, and then we can run again, right? Those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and it's also just teaching her, because if she is a runner, she's going to need to learn how to tune into to her environment. Um, um, sometimes if it's about control, um, I might wait it out. I got this little, like, okay, I'll wait. That's usually when I give a choice, and they're like, no! Nah! I don't want either of your choices. Um, I have a diff couple different responses to that. One is just wait. Um, my other response, I've given a choice and they say, no. And I might say, oh, don't make a choice yet. Like, think about it. Take your time. Like, this is an important decision, right? I'm just kind of bringing them back down. Not This is not like you need to make a choice now. I'm never presenting a choice that is rushed and has to be made now. Right, so how we present that, it makes a big difference. Not, I gave him a choice. I said he could do it or I would stop or I'd do it for him. Not so much a choice. Um, sometimes I will make a choice for you because some of our kids don't know how to make choices yet. We are working on that in our classrooms. With some, sometimes that is their goal, learning how to choose from two things. You have a kid who wants everything. I mean, they don't get everything. There's a, a meltdown. So some of it takes practice, especially when they're, it's not highly motivating things, and we can work through that. But um, so I'm just giving them a little bit of time. Just because we gave them two options doesn't mean we need them to decide immediately. Ten seconds feels like a long time. In the grand scheme of things, ten seconds is not that big of a deal. I mean, I can't even get to five seconds <laughs> of not talking. That was like that was so awkward and long. I was trying to go to five. Actually, I was trying to go to ten, and I couldn't because it's so long and it feels really long. And so sometimes when we give kids choices, we want a response right away. Everything we do, we want a response right away. Like, look, go, 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 right? Like that's how our brains are becoming programmed. So, giving them a chance to respond, especially our kids with communication delays um, who need processing time, give them the processing time. It feels better to you, and it feels better to them. And then they can actually make a choice that might feel good. Um, moving on a little bit, because I want to make sure that I get through at least some of the material, but also answer your questions. But if it's to gain attention, my favorite kind of mantra is ignore the behavior, not the child. Not always in... Whatever you want to come in. I forgot you yeah, were I was going to say, like, when do I get a term for crying out loud? What slide am I on? Uh, Four? Page eight. Oh, that's it. I'm supposed to go to like 24 anyway. So, okay. ignore the behavior and not the child. This is one of my favorite things because behavior to me is communication. They're communicating something to me. Um, they're saying what, whether I have a kid standing on a table. I get kids standing on a table all the time. Yeah, standing on the table. Sometimes I don't care that the kid's standing on the table because I know that they're not going to fall off or they're a pretty safe kid. If they're an unsafe kid, I might have to do something about it. But I might see a kid on the table, and I know they want my attention, and I'm going to give my attention, but I'm not going to give them my attention because they're standing on the table. I'm going to give them my attention for something else, and I'm going to make something up if I have to. Oh, my gosh, you wore your Paw Patrol shoes today. Make it up, right? I'm not ignoring the child, but I'm not addressing them. I'm not talking about them because they're standing on the table. I mean, I am in my mind. 
But they don't know it. I never say get off the table. I never said you can't do that. I just say, oh, I know your Paw Patrol shoes? Those are pretty cool. Let me see those. Right? And now I'm connected. And now I'm with them. And then I can move towards getting them off the table. Sometimes they'll just get off the table because they didn't get the response that they wanted. Now, does that make sense? Um, again, I take all behaviors as a form of communication. So when I hear screaming or I see fighting or I see kicking, my first thought is this child needs me. They don't need me to punish them. They don't need me to blah, 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 but they do need me. So um, a lot of times, like if I'm getting hit because they want my attention, and I might just go um, ignore the hitting because most people can't. It's a really hard thing for somebody to not say, uh, no, thank you, don't hit me, I don't like that, that's not safe. Uh, what are the other ones? Um, no, thank you is usually No, good. thank you is my favorite. Yeah. Yes. I don't know what that means, but say when people hit you. Yeah, no, thank you. But I hear that one a lot. But or hitting's not safe, or um, but I might just get gentle hands, uh, use your words, um, all those things. And they're not terrible things to say, but I'm addressing the behavior, and I want to make sure I'm not really necessarily going to give you attention for that behavior. I had a little kid with a thing in his mouth today. Scary, yes. But I also knew that if I said, spit that out, that's not safe. He would have run, and now I would have had a kid with a bead in his mouth running around my room, dysregulated. So he stood there, trying to bite on it so I could really hear. Like, he wants me to really know that it's in his mouth. And I, I just watched him, monitored him for safety, and I, I just said, that was the kid that I pulled up. Wow, are you really mad? Yeah. You know, spit it out, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I didn't even have to address I already know that he knows that he shouldn't have a bead in his mouth, so I don't need to tell him that. He just wants my attention. The same thing he was doing before was just screaming at me. Ah! And I might just say, did you need something? You could say, teacher Colleen, or you can pat. But I'm not going to say don't scream. Does that make sense? So that's ignore the behavior and not the child. I had a teacher who did really great at it. He was walking a kid out to the bus, and the kid's just hitting him. The teacher's like, man, I'm really glad you came to school today. We had so much fun. And the kid's like, but I'm hitting you. <laughs> and the teacher's like, oh, I was just walking you to the bus. Like, I'm not going to respond to those types of behavior that are just to gain my attention. And then I'm going to work on better ways to get my attention. Does that make sense? This is kind of a little mantra I do. I sometimes do some planned ignoring. Um, sometimes if I'm just waiting a kid out, I will get a book or a piece of paper and pretend like I'm working just to show that you're not taking up my time, you're not, you know, and I, I'm okay with what you're doing for right now, right? A lot of, I get a, excuse me, a lot of kids that kind of run away and hide and then they expect you to come get them. I'm going to come near you, but I'm not necessarily going to come get you. So I might just start writing, drawing. If they're yelling at me, I like writing down what they say. And then, okay, I hear you. Let me write, hold on, let me write that down. Then they're like, well, write this down too. <laughs> it's my favorite. Write this one down too. And they have all pleasant things to say to me. And then we can start well, reversing that. But kind of just planned ignoring. I'm going to kind of do my own thing. I'm here with you and I'm ready to support you, but I'm not going to give you a lot of attention for it. If it's just this kind of, not, it, they're safe. They're just not doing what I need at the moment. Um... Yeah, the kind of occupy yourself, get a book. It's kind of that when you know you're waiting maybe for your child to go to bed and they're just yelling for your name. Ah, mom. You know, and just, oh, I'm reading my book. I'll, you know, I'll do, I'll check in with you when you're done, or I'll make sure I turn off your light. But like, um, just hanging out, waiting for you. Escaping a task is uh, a little harder. First, we have to think about what is the task and is it age appropriate. <coughs> Thinking more about school and some of the tasks we expect our kids to do, but also at home as well. I had a parent that was like, well, I just need my four-year-old to get up and get dressed in the morning so we can get to school because I have a two-year-old that I have to deal with. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Typical four-year-old or not typical four-year-old, that's a difficult task, right? So how do we think about breaking down tasks so that they can be successful? Um, usual, using like a visual schedule. I don't know if you've been to our kids' bathrooms, but we have visual schedules on how to use the bathroom step by step. The kids who need it, use it. The kids who don't need it, still like it. My 10-year-old nephew, I was living with him last year, brought home a poster of how to wash your hands and hung it up in our bathroom and said, Colleen, now we know how to wash our hands. This will show you. And I was like, thanks. Like, but he was proud of it. He doesn't need it, but he had it. 
it doesn't hurt. Um, so using visuals to kind of help them get through routines or tasks or to break something down, such as a bedtime routine. Um, I use a lot of first then language. Yeah. I put that uh, printout they have in the bathroom. Yeah. In the bathroom at my shop. Yeah. I tell you what, it works. <laughs> <laughs> They clean up. I mean, it was. Yeah. We had another business move in, so they were using our bathroom, and it was a bunch of office ladies, and they started complaining to me, and I just took it and stuck it in there. And I tell you, I'm not a complaint a year and a half later. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, like, it works, and it, like, kids want to be successful. Adults, we want to be successful. Everybody wants to be successful, so it's like, well, yeah, I could do that. Okay. Easy. Yeah. How to do it. How to do it. your pants back I mean, it is. It's step by step. It also makes it easier, especially those like hand washing ones when kids are up there and they're usually spraying the water everywhere, right? And if I have a visual, I just go, okay, you turned on the water, good job. Hands are wet, right? It's like, awesome. Now it says get soap, right? And I don't have to tell them to stop spraying. Their behavior is telling me you need my help and my support, but I'm not going to address that. And, you know, I'll have another teacher going, hey, stop spraying water. And I'm like, you say stop spraying water. What are they going to do? Spray, spray, spray water. more water. Right? Oh, this is what you don't like? Um, and I just come in and say, oh, your hands are wet. Next step says soap. Let's get your soap. Right? Or they've done the soap and they're rinsing their hand. Oh, your hands are wet. And I'll turn off the water because that's what it says to do next. And it eliminates a lot of these battles, a lot of these, ex, you know, where the behavior escalates, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, let's see. You might have to modify your tasks, and that's okay. Are our expectations for our kids acceptable? Sitting at the dinner table for 30 minutes, that might not be an acceptable expectation for some of our kids. So what do I do? I set a timer for one minute. Oh, my gosh, you sat at the table for one minute. This is amazing, right? And I slowly increase it because I want to build their confidence and I build their skill. I want them to be successful. Kids want to be successful. So when, they can, when I can help them be successful and I can praise it, I can move to the next step and the next step and start to bump that up. Does that make sense? Uh, first then language, just usually we have a lot of visuals here. You can ask for these for home. Um, just first party, then wash hands. Uh, first sit down at the table, then I'll bring you your snack. Very simple language. First your shoes, then out the door. Uh, instead of, hey, you need to get your shoes on before we go out the door because if you don't have your shoes on, we can't get in the car and it's raining outside. What do you want them to do? Oh, put on their shoes and get out the door? Sure. First shoes, then door. Right? Simplify our language for our kids, especially in those moments. Um, it's helpful. We can use longer sentences and explanations in play at the dinner table, at bedtime when you're reading to them. Right? It's not that I'm saying... Never talk to your child in longer sentences. But if you have demands or things that you want to put on, keep it simple. Kids want to be successful. If you're talking to them and their lid is flipped or they're partly flipped or they don't understand because you talk too fast because they have slow processing in one ear out the other and then you just, you get nothing or you get behaviors. So I'm pretty sure I wrote this next batch of slides. Great. Shall I can give you a little break? Yes. Okay. So I had, um, oh wait, you can go back to school. Oh no, I skipped the page, sorry. So my youngest son was my challenging child, and I was a school psychologist when he was born, and I consulted with nearly every professional that I worked with on how to fix my kid. Um, what I've learned in the meantime, he's now 19, and um, he, <laughs> our family joke is he didn't ever go to jail. And uh, <laughs> like we, success. Um, he's a good kid. He's actually a really great kid. He turned out um, pretty well. But uh, he, a lot of the skills and strategies that I talk about, I learned firsthand from him because he was a challenging child. Um, so one of the things that I like to talk about with families is how to prepare for events. So you probably could tell me the times when your child is most likely to have a behavior um, or times that are going to be really challenging. Dining out was incredibly difficult for us. 
Um, getting into the car seat was usually difficult for us. So I would try to prepare in advance and have, like, I'm the one with the totally developed prefrontal cortex, so let me have a good game plan. So helping to, like, thinking about the steps that are involved and then having a plan is really important and it can help prevent the behaviors. It doesn't always prevent the behaviors. That was the other thing that I learned is that um, an irrational three-year-old is still an irrational three-year-old. Like, you can use all the strategies that Colleen gives you, and if you're dealing with an irrational three-year-old, some days it's just not going to help. And you just have to man It's like about your own self-management so that you're still in control as the parent and making sure everybody's safe and doing the things they need to do. I, I really liked giving warnings, letting them know what to expect. So kids, I mean, think of how many times you checked your schedule during the day or your calendar. Kids don't have that, so I like to let them know what to expect, what was going to be coming up. Talk about what will or will not happen. So we're going to the store. I will get you a snack, but we are not going to buy toys. Um, I did do a lot of the pre tea or the the prepping in advance, like when my kids especially were little. I didn't want to deal with a meltdown in the grocery store, so I we would talk about what snack do you want. Um, I wasn't going to buy a super expensive snack, but I, you know, a dollar for a can of Pringles was well worth the quiet. Actually, our trick was Costco. I always took the kids hungry. We went at dinner time, and they sat in the cart. And the first place we went was to the food court, and we bought pizza and pop. One sat in the basket, one sat in the front part of it, and I could at least get through half the store before everybody was done and wanting to get out. So um, there's nothing wrong with knowing what your child likes and then using that to help manage their behavior. Make a list and using the visuals or pictures actually ended up being a really great strategy to use with my little guy, especially as he got to be about kindergarten age. I wanted him to complete more than one task at a time, so I would use a sticky note and I would draw a picture of what I wanted him to do. So usually it was like toothbrush, a shoe, maybe his backpack, and I'd put little check boxes next to it, hand him a pencil and say, I need you to go do these things. You need to put on your shoes, do your, like go brush your teeth and do this. Now, if you have a child that can't do multiple steps, then you're gonna start with just the one. And that's how you would teach it. You would just do like the toothbrush, it's time to brush teeth, come on, let's go do it. But kids also like to feel important. And so like with the um, little one at the grocery store, maybe too soon, but even if you had a very simple list that had like a picture of an apple, a picture of, two or three of the food items you're going to get and it becomes like a, you're watching to see when it's, when do we have these things. Oh look, I put it in the cart. You can cross it off on the list now. Definitely offering process time and then have your backup stuff items ready and available. I don't think there's anything wrong with having special toys or tools that you use in certain situations. Um, you know, like you're talking about using the smartphone at the grocery store. It might be, and I don't know, but it might be that the only place where we use the smartphone is at the grocery store. So that's like the super special thing we do. And if we're asking at home, no, nope, sorry, we, don't, we only use the phone when we're at the grocery store. So have a little, um, have a bag that, or a backpack that has some highly preferred things in it that you pull out when you know it's going to be a time that might be difficult, like waiting, waiting at the doctor's office, waiting at an appointment, anything like that. This one um, was tricky. My son was, um, he was definitely very oppositional when he was little. In fact, um, one of my favorite examples is I worked with a lady who talked to me about compliance training and she said, oh, compliance training is great. When your child is doing the thing you want them to do, you just pair the command with it because kind of like making that neural pathway, which probably works great for like 85% of the kids in the world, but not mine. So he's one day he's getting into his car seat and his little butt's getting ready to plop down in the seat and I think, oh, I'm going to do it now. And I said, Brandon, get in your car seat. And as soon as that phrase left my mouth, he stopped mid-squat and popped right back up and was like, uh-uh, I'm not doing it. It didn't matter that it had just been his idea. Um, that was not going to work for him. But for a lot of kids, uh, <laughs> you don't want to ask them to do something because if you ask, it leaves the room for no. So if you ask, are you ready, you know, like, do you want to go to blah, 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 and they say no, you've kind of boxed yourself in because either now you're going to make them mad by saying, well, too bad we have to go anyway. Um, 
or you, then you have to come up with a plan B because, oh crap, I didn't know they didn't want to go to the grocery store, now I have to figure something out. So it's better just to give, make a statement, it's time for the grocery store, it's time to do this, it's time to do that. <clears throat> yeah. So is this bad? Like, uh, for example, with my little brother, I have to tell him what I'm doing, what we're doing. And so, for example, I'm going to get some money. Sometimes I'm already going to say yes. Like, I so I don't have to bad tell him, like, asking questions. Well, asking, is you ready? Are you ready? That's okay, because that's, that's like asking where, like, his state of being. Like, are you all ready to go to school? As long as he knows what that means. That means, like, your teeth are brushed, your backpack's by the door, whatever that means for you. It would be different if you said, um, do you want to, do you to wanna get ready for school right now? Because what if he's watching cartoons? And he's like, I do it because he starts to ask me what time it is now. Uh huh. I get ready at 12.30. Okay. And so he'll tell me, oh, what time is it? I'm like, oh, 12.15, yeah, two more minutes. That's fantastic. So, like, that's what my, so, like, when you say, I'm like, oh, wait, am I doing it wrong? Not with him, no, it sounds like that's working for him. What you could do is, it, but at 12.30, you would say, it's time to get ready for school now. It's 12.30. He's going to do that. You wouldn't want to say, hey, do you want to get ready for school now? It looks like it's 1230. Because what if he says, no, I don't want to get ready for school now? Then then what are you going to do? I have a long summer set. So, like, on my phone, 630, it's time. If you're not already in the jammies and ready for bed, my alarm goes off. And I go, okay, well, I'm going off. What does that mean? He goes, it's time for bed in the classroom. At 1030, the Alexa alarm goes off. And go, oh, Alexa's calling you. It's time to get ready for school if you're not dressed yet. So I have this something where it's not really smart as you tell me. It's like I have this backup secret person who's like, hey, by the way, it's ready. And he's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. so and questions aren't help. bad uh -huh. if he's able to respond. It's The questions are a challenge when... They don't, when they say no, and then we want them to do it anyways. Does that make yeah. sense? So yeah. that if, if it's like, well, every time I ask him, he just says no, well, then we're going to say, then stop asking him questions. Okay. Yeah. But if it's working and it's it's not a terrible thing to ask questions, okay. but it's one of those tools if you're those, well, I asked him if he was ready, and he said no, and then we had to do it anyway. So, yeah. So. so when the child is upset, we're going to talk a little bit more about the escalation cycle, but this goes back to what Colleen was saying. Limit the amount of language. If your child's screaming and yelling at you, you can't rationalize with them. Um, just affirm, I can see that you're mad. Um, yep, this is upsetting. Oh, I can see that you're sad now. You're crying. Um, even if they have to do something that they don't want to do, be clear, but just be neutral. Um, and really, I can't say this enough, try to stop explaining. We love to talk, and when, they're, oh, when they've gone off the deep end, like it's not helping them, it doesn't help you. Um, you know, if you need to talk about it, call a friend. Don't, <laughs> don't process with your um, hysterical four-year-old. Um, and definitely give your child a little bit of time to respond. I know this is hard, like especially if, if it's time sensitive. The, one of the greatest gifts that I gave to myself was figuring out that my boys were not morning people. And so I would, for years, I delayed waking them up till the last possible minute. And then somewhere around fourth grade, I think, it was between third and fifth grade, for my oldest son, I thought, you know, I'm gonna do the opposite. He likes to putter around the house in the morning, so I'm actually going to wake him up about 90 minutes early, and I'm going to let him go watch TV, and I'm going to let him take a shower, and I'm going to let him meander through his breakfast, and it totally changed the tone of our morning. I didn't get as much quiet time in the morning because I liked having an hour or so without the kids awake, but it totally took the hassle out of the mornings because he just needed more process time and more transition time in the morning. He didn't want to have to get up, get dressed, and then go immediately to school. I know you don't like to have dance parties in the morning. In the <laughs> yeah, you, you got to schedule them. You got to give them time. Oh, yeah. You wake up at 6 o'clock and we don't have to listen to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when when my oldest was in the fifth grade that year, he had, went through a phase where he didn't really like going to school, and so I bought popsicles, and he was allowed to have a popsicle every morning in the shower. I would go, okay, so I'm a little bit of an enabler, but um, I'll do that. <laughs> so I'd turn the shower on, get the water just right, I'd be like, yay, your shower's on, and he'd come downstairs, and I'd have a popsicle, and I'd hand it to him, and he'd just grab his popsicle, and he'd go get in the shower. And 
I justify this because, like, the only thing that gets me out of bed in the morning is going to turn on the water pot so I can make my cup of coffee so I can do the thing. Like, we have routines. And so I wasn't going to deny my child the benefit of a comforting morning routine just because, for example, everyone I knew thought it was ridiculous. It worked for him. It worked for us. <laughs> going to school is important. So you have to weigh those. Yes. Things. And not going to school in tears was really important because we went through about four years where almost every morning was just this huge crying thing. So the fact that we got out of that was really wonderful. I also like the idea of time in and not time out. So the thing with time in, and there's a lot of different um, examples of ways in which you can do this, but what I try to do is um, to learn your own triggers so that when you notice like the thing that, that your child is doing that's likely upsetting you, is to stop and um, maybe instead of, if you're finding yourself getting close to that, like he needs to go into timeout, I'm going to send him to his room, I'm going to do the discipline, um, maybe stopping and inviting your child in for a little bit of one-on-one -on -one attention. So stopping what you're doing when you can um, to sit and maybe cuddle with them for a few minutes on the couch, read a story with them, connect with them, and then go ahead and help reintegrate them into whatever activity um, you want them doing appropriately. Part of the problem too, yeah, just is with, um, at least for moms of boys, um, I used to say stop it a lot, um, but I wouldn't tell them what to do instead. And I learned if I said stop it but didn't give them the what I wanted to do instead, they were going to find something that I was going to find probably even less desirable than what they were doing to begin with. Question. Okay, so my son has an issue with dinner. Uh -huh. So we were separating him from the dinner table to like, calm him down uh -huh. he was he flips his leg at dinner table um and it it was never like a timeout it we just went to a different room he's been putting himself in timeout okay what what is i would well that about if timeout <laughs> if timeout is is supposed to be punitive what you want to do is change the tone of that because what he's essentially if he's self-selecting it what he's really saying is i need a break and so I would just be calling it, you need a break. So like, oh, I see that you need a break. You've gone ahead and gone to your bedroom. Um, you can do the same thing at dinner time. If he's starting to lose it, it might be like, oh, I can see that you need a break. So I don't know what your routine is, but it's like your food will be here. Why don't you go to your room for 15 minutes and then come back? Or if he takes his food, I don't know. Um, but as, if he's putting himself in timeout, he's essentially telling you, I need to step away from this. And that's actually really amazing that he is doing that. We teach Let's, it in our I classroom. Think you're giving him a lot more credit than he deserves. <laughs> okay. So, is he, do you think he's escaping, or like? Well, he doesn't do it during dinner. He'll do it like in the middle of playing, or he'll be playing by himself and I'm yeah. doing the dishes. And it's not even where we have like our decompressing from our dinner meltdown. It's he's given himself a spot on the couch and he goes and he, like. So my th my what is he trying to tell me? Is my guess is get your attention. But it also could be that kids act out like uh, familiar play schemes or familiar schemes. So like I think about like, um, so back in the day, I used to get spankings from my mom and I remember like then spanking my dolly because like I got spanked and I'm like trying this out. Kids, kids will repeat what they see. It's why you see little girls walking around with play cell phones or all little kids walking around with play cell phones. So he's processing through that play scheme you might um, when he's doing that you might go sit with him on the couch and offer to read him a story or say oh are you are you feeling okay what's going on you're not in timeout right now you don't have to be here okay. yeah I just have a question about the timeout sometimes my son is he will be bored at the end of next month but for the oldest it works when I do timeout if he's starting a daily meltdown so I will be like go to the room when you feel better, just come out of the room and mm -hmm. he cries, he lets everything out, and then he's peaceful, you know, he gets out. Okay. And for my youngest, I'll give him a time out, of, but not too long, for five, ten minutes. Yeah. And then, but he's not in it, he's doing everything in the room, so I don't know if that's actually a time out, or I don't know what to do. No, he doesn't, it sounds like he doesn't know how to help himself calm down, so sending him to his room might actually be agitating him more. And so it's probably better when you need to remove him to maybe go with him and say, I can see you're upset. Can I give you a hug? 
Um, what can I do to help you calm down? Um, it's always better, if we can, to try to catch them before they totally lose their cool, but that doesn't always happen. But if he goes, yeah, if he's going in there and just like throwing a tantrum, he's probably not, he doesn't really know how to help himself calm down. Yeah. But at the same time, he's saying not to repeat that behavior. So what's an example of what he would get sent to timeout for? When he hears a lot of, don't do that, don't do that. Things like that, or when it's uh, like time for to go to brush his teeth or stuff like that. Oh, so when it's time to go brush his teeth, then he's gonna. Yeah. It's gonna be tumble, but yeah. yeah. Um, Colleen, what would you? I mean, I if timeout. See, what I would t say is timeout's not working. Yeah. You want him to go to timeout and calm down, and he's not. So timeout is not a good strategy. So you probably want to try to look for some different things that you can do to help get him calm that maybe is not sending him to his room to go to go do to go get upset. And I think what she had asked too is how do you not like uh, ignore the child ignore the behavior and not the child. So yeah. if he's in there you might just say, Wow, you're still really sad. Can I help let me help you? Because what Stacy's saying is he still needs you to help him calm. Um, and you're not helping him calm because he's throwing things, you're helping him calm because you see he's still upset. Does that make sense? And so you can start to work on that of Let's go to your room together and know that he might need that. It worked for your one son, and that's okay. But when it's not working, that's when we have to try to find something different. So it might be, hey, let's go to your room together, and I will help you calm or breathe or hug or whatever those types of things are. The other thing is, sense? too, he may need more time than just five or ten minutes. Like, um, my youngest didn't do well with any sort of removal from the group. That always made him mad. And so... Um, you know, we had to find other things too, but when, even from the time he was a baby, like his tantrums would last for well over an hour. And so, but my, that wasn't the case with my oldest. He would kind of recover more quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I have three boys and my oldest, he is going and a half and he likes to laugh hysterically. Like when he gets in trouble, mm -hmm. The wrong response. So like time out when he's being naughty, it does not work. Yeah. Time out in front of us so he knows we're not mad uh -huh. or anything. But he's just like, look at me, try to move his chair, so we put him in a different chair, he can't move, and he's just laughing at us. Right. So then the question you would want to ask yourself is, well, how is this working for us? And then what might you need to try instead? Um, one of the things, I don't know if it's in this packet or not, but let me just look at the back here and see my book recommendation. So one of the things that I found super helpful as a parent, no, it's not, okay. Um, one of the things that I found helpful as a parent was reading really any reliable book about parenting um, because there's always a little nugget of something in there that you can try. So, um, you know, I, I think about the fact that I had a master's degree in school psychology, and when my crazy little four-year-old hit the scene, um, I didn't know what I was doing. And then as, as I was actually um, in the course of my work and then with my kids, I started reading some just different books that would be recommended about parenting. And I'm not kidding you, there wasn't a book that I read that I, where I didn't get to the end and think, dang, I wish I'd have read this like three years ago. Um, the Five Love Languages for um, Children is a phenomenal book that has great positive discipline strategies in there for things that you can try with your kids. Uh, five Love Languages for Children. Now, I will warn you, I think, I can't remember, it's been a number of years since I've read it. It might be written from a more, re um, I know the author is considered a Christian author, but I don't recall that the book didn't teach any specific doctrine or um, there wasn't any harsh discipline. It's a very positively based discipline book that's just a great um, guide for suggestions and strategies that you can do to help discipline your kids in ways that are effective but also still help your child feel loved. One of the things I found out with my youngest is that quality time is important to him. So every time I removed him from our family and sent him to his room, what he was internalizing was they don't love me. And that's not what I meant. I just needed him to get away before we killed him. Um, so I had to start looking at different strategies to use to discipline him that didn't actually um, affect how he, that he, I didn't want him to not feel loved. So, um, 
there, I mean, really, you could Amazon like popular parenting books, anything on positive discipline, uh, sometimes love and logic stuff is good. But you just need to give yourself some, like, some extra tools to use because timeout for this little guy is obviously not an effective strategy. So then you're going to want to start um, experimenting to see what might help. The other thing, too, though, is asking, like, what is the purpose of your timeout? If your timeout is punishment, then I think we kind of go back to that first slide of if your child's demonstrate, you know, if they're misbehaving, we probably need to actually be teaching more than punishing. But if your timeout is to like separate the child because the family needs a break, then I would probably say, you know what, I need a, I always just owned it. Look, I need a break from you right now. Um, let's go to your room and play with your Legos. I'm going to set the timer for 15 minutes. Don't come out until the timer goes off. Um, sometimes I just needed some separation between him and the other kids or from him and I. So really examining what's the purpose of timeout. You can have some kids that timeout will be great and they'll sit and they'll think about what they did wrong and they'll come out and they won't do it again. And other kids like my little guy or your little guy, um, sometimes it can just make the situation worse or it's just not effective. And then you end up getting, usually I get pretty pissed off myself. Um, and then I'm having to now manage my own emotions. So I would be thinking about what uh, what you're hoping to accomplish with it right now. We have four minutes left and okay. about a lot of slides. But some of the slides are just uh, more examples of things. I would go through them kind of briefly, um, maybe skip the escalation cycle because mm -hmm. that's the brain. Mm -hmm. But just kind of talking, stating what you want them to do. Um, we've talked about probably a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So, but maybe just scroll through. To some of the like. Well, and breathing. actually, we could use. I think most of the things on here are described. So, okay. if you guys would like to take the next couple minutes and just ask any other questions that you have, I have a couple handouts too. If you're interested, one is on um, a book of children, a list of children's books about a variety of different topics. I love using kids' books to teach things. So, there's in the list like the title of a book that might talk about being a friend. Um, they have a list of books for talking about sad feelings, feelings in general, um, good behavior expectations. And so these are kind of kids' books and you can look through. My idea would be just search them on the li in the, at the library and check them out because they're just kids' books anyways. And within those, you can start teaching some lessons around whatever it is you're thinking about, feelings, things like that. Um, some of, there's some here on grief and family relationships and all sorts of stuff. And so. some of the children's programs, um, especially the stuff that's offered on PBS, I, you guys probably all watch or your kids watch <laughs> Daniel Tiger. Yeah. Um, I've been Tiger. really impressed with some of that. And, um, you know, well, I've got a three-year-old niece and nephew. I also teach Sunday school for toddlers. And so, you know, I can remind kids about that. Remember when Daniel Tiger... Did da 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 da. What did he do? First, he took a deep breath, and then he did the thing. And um, those can also be really great for helping to teach the skills. And what is a good way to help? Like when they're escalated and screaming and they can't move, you don't teach them. Oh, well, how do you help calm them down? From that? Um, so those are some of the um, things. Um, well, I'm going to pass this out just so you guys have this. So how do we calm them? My first thought in those situations is the escalation, and so. A lot of times it's presenting myself with that kind of that woe of just saying I'm here for you and I'm going to either rub your back if you let me, I'm going to help, hey, hey, what can I do to help? I'm not going to lecture or do all those types of things. I'm going to most likely just be with the child and take on some of that big emotion for them. I'm holding space for them is what we call it. So like, and I'm, and I'm breathing. I'm and making sure I'm breathing because what I want in that point is calm. The teaching moments are when you're playing together, when you're having dinner together and enjoying things, or when you're pushing her in the shopping cart and something happens. Those are the kind of the, the teaching moments. Um, in the moments of escalation, it's calm and safety. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is safety. Safety is Keeping usually. them safe. Um, you know, depending on the situation, sometimes it would be going to the bedroom, um, making sure that they're not tearing things up. Sometimes I would have to go sit in the bedroom with my youngest or I'd sit in the doorway while he was screaming and yelling and 
also throwing up because that's usually what he did when he started to scream and yell. Um, and I just had, to, you know, you just had to wait it out because when they're that gone, it's all, this is the thing, it's all chemicals and hormones. Like it's cortisol, it's adrenaline, it's all the fight or flight stuff. And honestly, the body has to metabolize that. And so sometimes, depending on your child's response pattern, you just have to wait for them to do, to do that. I'm generally trying to communicate with my body language or if I'm using words, my words, that I'm, I'm here to help you and I'm on your side and to support you. Not necessarily here to make you do what I need you to do because I've most likely abandoned that for that moment. Um, in that moment, it's... And I'm going to kind of wait it out a little bit and see if I can't provide some comfort. The nice thing about them being such little kids is generally they will accept our comfort or our being there with them because naturally they want to need that to help support them. Um, so in those moments of tantrum, I'm looking for calm and trying to keep myself calm at the same time because if my lid's flipped, nobody's got any skills right now. So, yeah. I have um, a question regarding behaviors that I generally don't want to have feel like I can attribute to like a want or a need or trying to sure. gain something. I can find it. Go Jacob ahead. Jacob is three years old <laughs> sure. and he's like a sensory processing issues mm -hmm. picture. Um, and he's really destructive. So like paper, like he'll rip it. He has to rip it. Markers, like he's going to bite. But we don't have a pencil with an eraser in the whole house. Gotcha. Um, mm -hmm. He always feels the need to like test that threshold of an object. So, I mean, toys, just if you left something within reach of him and turn your back for a second, then he's going to be destructive. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So he is probably seeking that sensory input. Okay. He's a, is he a sensory seeker? Would, has somebody ever said that to you? He does both. He seeks and avoids some yes. sensory things. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like he needs a lot of input or a lot of things to kind of explore his environment. And so that's where I say it's, it's seeking that input. So I'm calm with the amount of input that I just generally get in this room. I'm at my baseline, right? Some people need a little bit more movement to help them feel calm and regulated, and it seems like he needs a lot more. So I can't just enjoy this, but I need to, like, you know, like, to really enjoy it, I need to kind of tactilely do it. So what you'll work with is an occupational therapist either privately or with us, to figure out how to meet that need so he doesn't feel like he has to meet it with every new thing that he comes in contact with. And it's a lot of work. But if it's a seeker and he needs a lot of input or that's how he explores, we've got to give him more appropriate ways. If he just explores things with his mouth, then maybe he needs a chewy or learn how to chew gum, things like that to kind of meet that need so that he doesn't feel like he has to do it with everything. And then the other thing might be when he has those things, is to teach him how to use them appropriately. Yeah, I try to see items where he he can destroy that too. Like awesome. if something designated he can chew it on, yeah. but he'll chew it to the point where it's a safety hazard because he's bitten a little piece off of yeah. it. Or and then part of it is, yeah, so and it sounds like a pretty challenging one in terms of finding what does work. Um, thinking, and not, maybe not at three, can't chew gum yet, but chewy. He does. Okay, great. I mean, yeah. well, that's great, beef but jerky. thinking beef yeah. jerky, those, um, we think about giving them not necessarily spicy foods, but foods with a lot of flavor that really heighten the sense of sour just chewy. I like, why does he have to destroy things? Like, why, if we have blocks, like, instead of stacking blocks, he wants to take a stick and take the and spray them. It's the adrenaline and those chemicals, and his brain is seeking them, and then once he gets them, he wants more, and, and he also, wants more. Does that make sense? So it's like, it's, so that's part of understanding the brain and how the brain works really helps you understand your child. It's not that he is just this kid that destroys everything, but he gets a response, and most likely a chemical response. And so we have to, something you might think about talking with your doctor about, or just how do I give him that so that he feels he's met his needs so he doesn't have to seek it so But much. I will say, too, that's also little boys, so... I'm a mom of two little boys. They tore up <laughs> everything we had. My first, um, my first son is like the other end of the spectrum where yeah. he's just really mellow and chill. So it was like a little jarring. Yeah. yeah. And part of it is, yeah, is that jarring and then... But also, things I, get destroyed. I want to draw your attention to this one too about exercise. Oh, yes. So, you know, you've heard this phrase a tired puppy is a happy puppy. 
You don't want to overtire your children or then you get the stress response again. But giving your kid enough exercise too can also help regulate him. And so if he seems like he's particularly destructive one day, that's the day where you might need to go to the park. If you can build into your daily routine a time where you are setting aside for exercise, whether that's something in the house or you go someplace where he can run and play, the McDonald's Playland was a savior for me with two boys. Like, I would take a book and say, you guys just have at it. Go for it. We'll leave when you're ready. That was like winning the lottery for them. Like, you can stay here as long as you want. I don't care. Yeah, I want to hear what he has to say. Yeah. Well, we, we had a 